Welcome to O Starry Night. Uh, my name is Terry Weber. I am the Gloucester 400 Plus Stories Project Leader. And if you don't know what the Stories Project is, most of you probably do because you're in this room. But if you don't, um, it is the collection of stories from people all across Gloucester this year in celebration and recognition of our 400 years of history. So all those stories are going to be collected into one huge collection and eventually find its home at the Sawyer Free Library so people years from now can read them, uh, people could do their own family research, etc. cetera. Uh, the year is gonna culminate as well in a, book, a commemorative book that is going to be coming out early in the year. And many of the people that you're gonna hear from tonight do have a story or a poem in the book, so it's pretty exciting. Um, there's a couple of people I wanna say hello to. One is the person who just said hello to me, Mary Tess Karate. <laughs> I, uh, I like to point her out sometimes because occasionally I give her the credit or the blame for me having this position <laughs> of Stories Project Leader. She referred me over to the organization and uh, it seemed to be a good fit. So thank you, Mary Tess. Uh, another person, Bob Gillis. Where are you, Bob? Hi, Bob. Bob is one of our tri-chairs and I believe Ruth is coming. She's not here yet, right? Um, Bob Gillis is one of the tri chairs of the Gloucester 400, so welcome to tonight. And Isabel Pett, next to him. Um, I want to shout out to Izzy as well, because uh, she is the events coordinator for the Gloucester 400. And compared to my paltry, maybe less than 10 stories events, she's had hundreds of events through the years that she's coordinated or co coordinated with our partners in the community. So, Izzy, thank you. <laughs> A couple of uh, housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, you should turn off your cell phones or at least turn the volume off on your cell phone so no one gets interrupted. And if you didn't already know, the bathrooms are right downstairs. Just walk right down the stairs, go straight ahead and take a right. Those are the, where the bathrooms are. Um, so this has been an awesome year, as I just said, and we really want to end it on a good and uplifting note with the, with the Stories Project. And there are still other events going on as well, but this is the last storytelling and poetry event for this year. So let's get this, uh, tr keep this trend going with awesome nights. And I'm going to introduce you to Bill Falsitano. He is the Gloucester 400 Poetry Coordinator. He's helped out throughout the year uh, providing and directing poets in our direction so that we can uh, share their works, whether it was on the Schooner Adventure or wherever it was. Um, so please welcome Bill Falsitano. Thank you, Terry. Um, boy, can you believe it's December? Can you believe the year went by so fast? I can hardly believe it. It seems like yesterday we were at the Beauport Hotel starting out. And I just want to, on a personal note, say thank you to everyone on the G400 Plus Committee. They've done an amazing amount of work this year, and uh, especially to Terry Weber, who's taking care of us poets and storytellers. Thank you, Terry. So tonight, I, we're going to begin with um, a poet who was unable to make it. She's not doing, feeling too well, so her name is Laura Plummer, and she's an award-winning poet and writer from Massachusetts. She has lived in Gloucester since 2014. Her work has appeared in numerous print and online publications. You could read it at lauraplummer.me. She's also uh, my neighbor, but how random is that? <laughs> I'm going to read her poem, um, a love poem to Gloucester. I came with just a suitcase. I never thought I'd stay. This town was just a detour, a pit stop on my way. Out west to California, where all free spirits go to be sun-kissed and mellow, to hell with cold and snow. I couldn't have foreseen what lay in store for me, and many winters later, I'm blooming by the sea. For Gloucester sank her hooks so firmly in my heart, it wasn't long before we couldn't be apart. She wooed me with her stories, a gripping history, her warm, inviting people, a vibrant tapestry. 
the glory of her nature is famous far and wide. I wander in her woodlands and on her beaches stride. And rising in the morning to hear Our Lady's song, I sometimes get the feeling I've been here all along. I've, I always love returning when life calls me to roam. And though I wasn't born here, I now call Gloucester home. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and thank you for reading that for Laura Plummer. She is an excellent poet, so I'm sorry that she couldn't be here tonight. Um, our first story is going to come from a friend, now friend, Shannon Morris. She, was, uh, she is a native of Gloucester. She was raised here. Uh, most of her family is from here. And she has come back to Gloucester after being away in college and her other pursuits, and now she also calls Gloucester home again. And one of her stories is making its debut in our commemorative book. So please welcome Shannon Morris. I have to get myself organized, so. Um, like Terry said, I was born and raised here. And I grew up just up the street from Destino's. And uh, loved to see us. Um, through my teenage years, I often thought that maybe my parents had no idea what they were doing raising kids. And then as a young adult and I had my own family, I realized they had no idea what they were doing because I had no idea what I was doing. And we were all just doing our best um, to raise children. And one thing that my parents did really well um, was they had moments of magic for us. And this story is about one of those moments of magic. And it's, the name of the story is The Case of the Purple Garland. Each Christmas, my father would coax me to the top floor of our old home with promises of adventure. We would carry the ladder to the third floor and lean it against the top edge of a square recess in the ceiling that opened directly to the stairwell, the perfect exploit for an uninhibited child. I would climb to the top of the ladder and unhook the clasp that in turn childhood memories. I would then move the old wooden barrier and slide it across the opening to balance on the wood slats that made up the attic. As years passed, I would eventually balance on the railing to stand on my tiptoes on the large round post, barely high enough to reach the top of the clasp. Once I removed it, I would hoist myself over the stairwell to disappear into the attic. I would need to balance only on the slats and be careful not to fall into the crevices holding insulation. I was told if I stepped in, I would fall straight through to the first floor. <laughs> and as my dad put it, your mother will kill me. <laughs> it was dark in the attic. It had a similar smell to the rustic cellar, wet dirt, spider webs, a small faint smell of ocean. I was in search of an old green trunk that held Christmas ornaments that dated back to before my birth and always took longer than expected while I eagerly greeted my childhood toys as I moved toward the octagon window that faced away from the harbor. There was some plywood to help with supporting the storage of old things. And when I finally did reach the trunk, I would need to carefully slide it the length of the attic to arrive at the entrance. I would hold the narrow metal handle and tip the trunk toward the opening and my father would reach up and retrieve it. I would take one final breath of attic air before retreating. Opening the trunk felt like a treasure hunt. As we reached in to organize ornaments, I would wait for my mom to tell the story that each piece evoked. The trunk also held all the lights and the colored shimmering garland. The most remarkable of all was the shimmering purple foil garland. It had lived its best life. There were splotchy, empty spots like an old balding cat. I had once seen a squirrel whose tail was reminiscent of the old purple garland. My mother was the first to reach for it, thinking she tossed it in the trash the year before. However, each year the garland managed to make its way back into the trunk. My father snatched it out of her hands and began wrapping it around the banister. He would then wrap the gold garland to help cover up the bald spots, then throw his arms in the air and say, ta-da, it's perfect. My mom would wait until we were tearing down Christmas ornaments to grab the foil garland and toss it. 
and each year it would reappear. <laughs> Until the year I moved to California, I received an odd-shaped object in a manila envelope. My mother had sent me the old beat-up garland, probably for safekeeping. Maybe she thought I would throw it away. In return, I scoured the stores and found brand new fluffy foil purple garland. I went to the post office and I mailed it to my father. Eventually, my mom conceded. When they built a new house and they moved away from the harbor, they had a spare bedroom. And in the spare bedroom, they put a white tree and they put purple lights and purple garland. And every year, family members would send a purple ornament to my dad. And in memory of my dad, um, we all find, scour the stores and find purple ornaments and we send them to each other. So Merry Christmas, Dad. Thank you. Like that? Is that better? Is that better? Is that better? Okay. How how about that? Is that better? Better? Oh, all right. We're just okay. Uh, yeah. Try to speak right into the microphone if you can. Uh, our next uh, reader is a poet, Heidi Wakeman. Um, Heidi has been writing and evaluating since the fifth grade, when each day in her diary, it received a letter grade. These days, she is less interested in grading and more interested in gratitude. That, that's in the season. That's in the <laughs> Heidi is an anti-racist educator, student, poet, naturalist, community activist, Gen X feminist, mother, wife, recovering perfectionist. She believes in the power of storytelling and story listening to provide windows, mirrors, and bridges between people. I give you Heidi Wakeman. How's that? Better? Yeah. Okay. So I'm so excited to be reading here and in front of this wonderful group of friends and familiars and some new friends and unfamiliars. Um, and it's my privilege to stand in front of you and share a couple pieces of work. One I wrote for this occasion and one I wrote at the beginning of this year. So we'll start with this one and it's called A Wise Place, A Peon to, a Peon to Home and see if you recognize any of these places. Home is a wise place, my home for 22 years, at the edge of a marsh and rising tides, encroaching fragmites, supermarket parking lot lights, and also the sunrise, the moonrise, falling stars and asteroids, herons, egrets, even glossy ibis, I spy them from our back deck, binoculars around my neck, looking away from the arranged marriage of the house I've grown to love. Coming here was what we could afford, could cobble together after moves from Lanesville, Bayview, Melbourne, Corvallis, Eugene, and so you may ask, the poet, how did I get here? To this rock, a port, a seaport of constant change. I am no native of the Bay State, but fate brought me to Gloucester, a 1970s story, starting and stopping and never staying put for long. We found ourselves each summer at the end of a bumpy road in Bayview, in tents, Quonset hut, quarry swimming, campfires, a somewhat single, sometimes stable mother and three kids. She was priced out of Rockport rentals, so we packed up, picked up, and landed on the land where a house was slowly being built, but never finished. Every June and August, unable to afford a Sandy Bay summer, unwilling to stay in Gloucester, 
except those two years of Fuller School, Lindale Ave, adventures of adolescence. Home was a red house by the railroad tracks. Home was a room I shared with my much neater sister. Home was two years of stability until home was packing up and driving west in a red Volkswagen van. A U-Haul trailer, mother, brother, sister, dog and pregnant cat. Our caravan landed in San Diego, home for one year. Beaches, bodies, and boy was I crazy for boys. Then adios, aloha, hasta la proxima. My ma was crazy for leaving home. And she brought us back to Rockport. Four houses, four years. Freshman, Thatcher Road. Sophomore, Parker Street. Junior year, Oaks Lane. Senior year, the button box. A one room shared with mother and brother. Oh brother, another year of making do, making messes, and making bad moves. Until I moved in with my sister in her top floor apartment, she was playing house on Mount Pleasant Street. I carried on with an older man who let me abuse myself, his girlfriend, and any notion of what love and home is not always healthy and safe. So in between Rockport and Gloucester, I left and came back, and by golly, I planted my roots deep in this ground, straddling the town line between Seaport and Sandy Bay, a Cape Anner, stubbornly resisting the pull to leave, weaving my way, a nest for my three babes, now fledged, now making homes of their own. Home is gardens and growing old together. Home is repair and redo and repeating this maintenance. Home is dogs and parakeets and conures and the garden beds where we bury them. Home is letting go of all of this, daughter, son, son, dogs, flowers. Home is wise place. So some of you were on the adventure this summer and you heard a different version of that. So I, I, again, appreciated the opportunity to put it all together in a poetic form. So thank you. And, and this poem, I'll, I'll say, was written around the turn of the year of 2023. And I thought it would be appropriate. And be, especially because of uh, where we're reading, I, I think you'll appreciate some of the symbolism. Honest Novus. <clears throat> looking back and looking forward, not because I'm two-faced, I'm a 21st century Janus standing at the doorway with an atlas, a compass, a sextant, a sky full of stars. Where are we going? What is the map we carry? Let us set the course together, another year, another rotation, another celebration. We turn away, we turn towards, we carefully unfold and understand the difference between a legend and a key. We are navigators of future realms, future us, future selves, sailing into the sea of a new year. Thank you. Our next storyteller is Caroline Haynes. I met her through the Stories Project, and you probably, a lot of you probably already know her from Gloucester or seen her face around here. She wrote an excellent story called Brown's Coffee Shop that really kind of captures a moment in time when we're not really thinking that much about the future and, and what good and bad times we face. We're just doing what's right in front of us and enjoying our time, and I really enjoyed that story. So please welcome Caroline up to the stage. Is that good? Yes. Okay. It was 1992, the height of glasnost and perestroika. Mother Russia was opening up. There were pathways everywhere. My pathway came through Pathways for Children, where I was working in the Head Start program. And suddenly, I was invited to go to Russia. I was to be part of a delegation of citizen ambassadors, all from across the country, 
all different Head Start staff people. And off we went. We landed in St. Petersburg, and our first impression was not good. The airport, there were no jetways. We came down off the plane, walked down the stairs across the tarmac into the falling down terminal where the luggage had stopped spinning years ago. They were, no, they were broken. So our, our first impression was not good. Oh, and I should have said, we were invited be, through the People to People organization, which was founded by Dwight Eisenhower back in uh, the 50s, and for the purpose of connecting people across cultures and fostering peace. So our first impression of the people in Russia was also not good. We could see that they were suffering and they were poor. On the bridges in St. Petersburg, people were lined up with fishing poles. Actually, the people weren't lined up, the fishing poles were lined up. They were not fishing for fun, they were fishing for food. The women in, the old, in an old cemetery, we went to the cemetery where Tchaikovsky was buried, and there were elderly women with buckets, begging buckets, asking for alms. Gypsies were everywhere with their children. Children would come up and rub your leg and attach themselves to you and hold up one finger. One, what did, what did they want? One what? One dollar? We didn't know. We were told not to let them touch us because they were pickpockets. People were desperate. And we found also that there was an incredible amount of theft going on. People were trying to survive. My roommate lost a gold necklace. It was in her bag, her suitcase, from the time it left the room on the fifth floor and it arrived on the first floor, the necklace was gone. Another woman, another one of our delegates, she was a big woman. She lost all her panties. They, were, they went to some big Russian woman, I'm sure. Another woman, she had a, an amazing wardrobe. Her entire wardrobe, including all of the leather goods, was gone. She wore a sweatshirt for the rest of the trip. So we weren't feeling the love. And then we discovered the, the organized crime. It was everywhere. Some young men were trying to sell us t-shirts and we said, could you come to our hotel tonight? We don't want to carry them around all day. They said, no, that's not our territory. We can't go there, they would break our legs. On the train from St. Petersburg to Moscow, we settled ourselves in our little compartment and there was a rap on the door. And when we opened it, a voice said, you can have anything you want on this train. We shut the door as quickly as we could and bolted it. So with that, we arrived in Moscow. And as I said, we weren't quite feeling the love. And being Americans and from our American consumer culture, we wanted to shop. But there was a catch. We weren't allowed to use our American dollars. We were required to trade them in for rubles, which were worth, worthless, except if we shopped at a government-run store. So we did go into one government-run store, and I was after a brooch, similar to this brooch right here. And I saw one I loved, but I wasn't going to pay my American dollar price that they were asking. So I thought, I'll, I'll wait, I'll find something. And it wasn't long before they took us to a huge street market called the Arbot. We waded our way through the gypsy children and we made our way to the street. People were selling everything. They were selling lace, crocheted items, hand-painted lacquerware, jewelry, balalaikas. You could find almost anything there. 
And as we walked through the crowds, I came upon a small table about this size with a vendor. And I looked down, and there was the most beautiful brooch that I really wanted. And next to it was a Matryoshka doll, the nesting doll. And on it was painted a frog. Now, my daughter collects frogs. I had to have it. So I negotiated in American dollars with the vendor. And as I reached for my wallet, he said, don't show your money. The KGB is watching us just now. Walk this way, and I will find you. Have your money ready. So I walked through the crowds. People were coming and going. I'm reaching in my pocket, trying to nonchalantly have my money ready and wondering, is, are they really watching me? Is, oh, and is he going to really find me? Will I get the brooch? Will I get the Matryoshka doll? And suddenly, there he was in front of me. He quickly handed me a small paper bag and said, Madame, here are your purchases. I took the bag. And then he said, put the money in my pocket. <laughs> I reached over and put the money in his pocket. And off I went down the street, very nervously wondering, are the KGB still watching us? Am I going to be arrested? What the heck is in the bag? Is it my brooch? Is it my Matryoshka doll? And I imagined he was watching, walking down the street thinking, what's in my pocket? He was probably fingering those bills and wondering if the texture was right for American dollars. So, what do you think? <laughs> yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You're welcome. <laughs> Oh, thank you. That sounds like something right out of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, right? <laughs> uh, next, we have a poet, Stuart Kurtz. Stuart was a staff poet for Verse Virtual. He has been represented in Poetry Quarterly, Ascent Aspirations, Common Line Journal, Parody, Sheep's Head Review, Poetry Superhighway, and more. He is uh, a regular reader of his poetry on Sterling Warner's The Union of Poets Open Mic. Sterling gave him the honor of a quote of approval for his book, Halcyon Days, Collected Fibonacci. He will be featured in the Gloucester 400 Stories Project, congratulations, online and in book form. I give you Stuart Kurtz. Th thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, Terry. So I'm going to be reading a poem in the voice of Gloucester's famous maritime painter. In fact, the greatest maritime painter of the 19th century in all of America, Fitzhenry Lane. And it's in, really in his voice coming out of the 19th century, if you can imagine. Okay. This is, can I get this a little higher? No? Shouldn't touch it? Well, I'm... Yeah. Sure. There we go. Thank you. Good. 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 It's fine. Good. Thanks. Okay. Holding on. With a glimmer of dawn, I rise. The horizon and my mind's eye stand as my raw canvas opens its lens to Aurora's dreams. It wants to retain substance, like the bit of lawn at the Sawyer homestead, or embraces rock, where my thoughts were pulled out to the unknown. So sketching wildflowers so precisely meant holding on. Drifting on. That line of rocks will moor me, perhaps. Not so, as they step into water and seem buoyed, buoyed by it. Ah, 
There's a lad skipping stones, as real as, uh, alas, the skips are but dashes of light. Across the harbor, boulders and barrels invite one to step across, but once past Coffin's Beach, is one prepared for the loss and the being found? Gloucester, too, forfends the breach. That storm cloud trades its light for a glow upon the center, sacrificing the town. In turn, the town diffuses into water. On the end, the Pavilion Hotel is yet there, while its sepia reflection portends its passing into memory. I give you rigging. Its grids break up sky and clouds into manageable sums, providing fact, a safety from inspiration. Images on the water intend to hold up their counterparts, or are they my reflections? In Norman's woe, I offer spits of land to pincer the Hesperus into state safe harbor, lest it be taken by the sea's imagination. Sailors populate foregrounds with the glow of ledgers and supplies. Backgrounds hold vessels under uncertain skies and intentions inside just the same. On a rough sea, clouds, perhaps resenting a space between sense and thought, try to smother the sun who has settled on all states. Waves peak to create a pathway for his escape. At an unsettled time on Somme Sound, an anemic Helios fights with leeching will to blow away an encircling pack of clouds. Are you willing to follow me beyond land and sea, past even air and vapor to the next realm? If so, you will indeed find elements as you will find their concepts. Should you not decide, look to edges. They form the contours of mountains to undo the burden of weight and time. The shimmer at the wave peaks as the sun smiles, attaching to the wing ends of gulls to steal the last rays of light for safekeeping. I too and you will go someday into luminescence, transcendence, Unless, unless it be, we are already there. Thank you. And I have a very short one, and this one is not for me. It's from my mother, now in assisted living. And I think she wrote this uh, back in the 50s when she was a, a, a master's candidate. This is, uh, appropriately enough, Winter Woes. Once again, snowy and icy have come into play, with pals slippery and fall down. They cavort in the park, so roughen the road with Sandy and Melter, while some summon shut eye and sleep in their shelter. Thank you. <laughs> By Marilyn Kurtz in shelter. <laughs> she wrote. Thank you. In the process of uh, scheduling this evening, we had some last minute cancellations uh, with people being sick, unfortunately. So there has, has been a little bit of a change. And in the little chaos of trying to put the agenda together tonight, I inadvertently left off someone's name, who I apologize to right now. His, <laughs> his name is Alexander Thompson. He wrote a wonderful story called My Best Friend Gardy. And um, I can tell by the way it was written that uh, Gardy was not only a great man, but the author is a great man and a good friend. So please come up here and tell your story. Sorry, sound engineer, that's too close. <laughs> so. I was just surprised by Caroline because her story begins uh, in uh, Soviet Russia, and so does mine. Um, uh, this is one of those left field things. I did not expect this to be a, uh, uh, a thing about uh, Christmas at all, so uh, that's not what I prepared my head for. 
So uh, in the aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the opening up of the two cultures, one thing that happened was the Boston Museum of Science got in touch with all of the people uh, involved in the space program in the Soviet Union and said, hey, we've been wanting to see your stuff ever since time immemorial. And uh, Gardy, my dear best friend of a uh, uh, very long time and I, uh, we were absolute space nerds. We uh, you know, read about uh, everyone from uh, John Glenn and Yuri Gagarin in the same breath. And so we wanted to see this because it was uh, all of the hardware they had used over the same period of time that we remember as uh, Mercury and Apollo and all the rest. Well, uh, so they shipped all of these uh, uh, pieces of apparatus to Boston and displayed them in the Great Hall in the Museum of Science. Now, Gertie hated trains and yet he got on board with me and we boarded the Bud Liner back then, that's what they ran on these lines. And uh, we went into North Station, then got on the Green Line and uh, uh, took a couple hops over to Science Park and then walked across the street and in to the museum where we watched a Mugar Omni Theater movie. Uh, the first IMAX theater was there in Boston at the Museum of Science, or the first one around here anyway. And they were showing a film called Blue Planet, uh, which featured the opening scenes uh, on board a sloop uh, that was being piloted by uh, one of Gardy's heroes, uh, a one-armed sailor whose name I cannot even remember right now. Uh, but it was fantastic. And after the show, we then led ourselves up to this gallery where they had all all of these things, I mean, it dwarfed this space here, but just like we have this winged ship, there were items from the collection hanging in the rafters and then all around us. Things that they had used uh, in Soviet Russia to land uh, on Venus, things that they had tried to send to the moon, things that they had orbited with various crews. And all of this was there and it just looked like something out of a Jules Verne novel because it was all very, put together with bolts and heavy. And we weren't used to looking at that when we were thinking of space hardware. We we're thinking of the very fragile tinfoil lunar excursion module and things like this. So we go in and we're just agog, looking around at this stuff. Now, when we had come into the museum, we had checked our coats. And uh, as a very proletariat you know, uh, sneaker wearing people, we were thinking, well, okay, fine. And so we took a coat check and we put our coats in with the coat check lady and she hung them up on a rack and sent them on their way with a number. And we were thinking, oh, great. Well, we're really riding high now, aren't we? So anyways, we go on our way and we're finally in the gallery. We're surrounded by all of this wonderful stuff from the Soviet space program. Um, and then over to one side is this not too large man, this diminutive, diminutive character, uh, and white-haired, uh, slightly balding, wearing a, a very summery blue plaid shirt, and he's just sort of fidgeting. He was the only person in there. We were amazed because there was nobody else. Nobody had bothered to come see this thing that we were chomping at the bit to uh, go ahead and enjoy. Well, he was wearing a little tag, which indicated that he must be some sort of docent or official. And so I said, okay, well, let's go find out what's up. And so Gardy and I walked up to him, and then I read the tag on this gentleman's shirt. Uh, and I realized this was none other a personage than Alexei Lyanov, the first person to walk in space, EVA, on an umbilicus from a uh, Soviet spacecraft. And there he stood right in front of us. And we had never heard of that story except for the regurgitated remains of stories that were told to us through Pravda, the official mouthpiece of the Soviet Union. So we were like, wow, great. First we shook his hand nervously, and then we both said, so what happened? And uh, in uh, somewhat very good English, he uh, explained what had happened. Here was uh, Alexei Leonov. He was launched with his friend, uh, into uh, uh, space and then the mission was for him to just go outside of the spacecraft and look around a bit while the uh, other cosmonaut was inside the capsule filming him and then go back in, shut it up, go back to Earth, 
post it all around the world. We did this first. Great. So uh, he manages to get out of the spacecraft. All good. He's got this umbilicus on. All good. He's safe. He's got a little device that is basically an air gun that shoots in different directions so he could pull himself through space and zero gravity. And that worked too. But the handmade spacesuit that he was wearing started showing some problems and the uh, vacuum of space was stressing it quite a bit. And he was hot because it was in the sun and uh, it started ripping its seams. And he could hear them as the stitches started popping out of the outer layers of this spacesuit that he was in. And suddenly he found himself in the unenviable position of being in the bright sun with the sun warming the atmosphere inside his suit while the suit turned him into the Michelin man and he no longer fit in the door of the spacecraft. So he's stuck out there and they talk back and forth trying to figure out, okay, what are we gonna do? All right, fine, uh, uh, try this, try that. And he's trying and trying, nothing's working. They don't wanna risk literally popping him like a bubble because that'd be the end of it. Um, so Alexi said, all right, well, we are, Cosmonauts, we have been trained for this kind of eventuality, and so I'm going to do the only thing we can. Now, those of you who remember the film 2001, A Space Odyssey, will remember the scene in which David Bowman is trapped inside a, a pod without a, a helmet for his spacesuit. And what he does is he hyperventilates, and then he pops the hatch and blows himself into the airlock, and then closes the airlock and fills it with air as quickly as he can. They got that from the real story of what Alexei Leonov did. Because Alexei Leonov reached down, timed it, hyperventilated, first of all, turned up the oxygen mix, hyperventilated, and then popped the cork on his own spacesuit. While this thing shrunk down to him like a seal meal, and he clambered in through the hatch. The other cosmonaut slammed the hatch shut and then repressurize the cabin because repressurizing the cabin was quicker than repressurizing the suit. And that's when Gardy and I stood there looking at each other and realized, and I'm going to speak blue to this audience now, that we were now standing in front of the man with the biggest balls we had ever seen. <laughs> and we were both, wow, wow, and he shook his hand again and went about and he told us about this one. This is a Venera one, that's a Voskhod, this is Vostok. And we had a great time. Now, back to the coat check. We're all very uh, 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 chuffed. We're very chuffed with our uh, experience. And we go downstairs to the coat check and we're like, great, we've had a great time. We've seen a movie, we met your, this uh, wonderful person who had shaken the hands of Yuri Gagarin. Now that was the part that was in our heads is that Alexei Leonov was really good friends with Yuri Gagarin, and so that was the hand that shook the hand of Yuri Gagarin, and we were, we were very much moved. So we go down to the coat check, and we grab our coats, and as we're about to turn away from the coat check, the person in the coat check turns to us and says, here are your umbrellas, two umbrellas. Lay them down. And I looked at Gardy, you know, like shrugged. I looked at the coat check person. We didn't have any umbrellas, we said. Okay, then we stepped out the door onto the street that was, uh, uh, we had to go across the street to the Science Park station of the T and then go up to the uh, upper gantry and wait for our train. And as we set foot on the sidewalk, before we got outside, the sky opened like heaven above and rained down in torrents that made yesterday look tame. It was just coming down in steady buckets and we ran as quickly as we could to get to the train. But by the time we actually stepped in the door of that old Green Line uh, hackney that they have, you know, the, if you remember the old trains, they were really quite rickety. But we, we got on board and we were soaked like sponges, right to the skin. And uh, we both smiled at each other and said, you know what? When the universe hands you an umbrella, take it. <laughs> uh. Umbrella, tape, all that stuff, Apollo 13. Um, well, next we have um, another poet, 
Kathleen Williams. Now, Kathleen um, is, um, o- over the years, uh, her family spent many happy summers in Rockport and Gloucester, riding her bike along Thatcher Road, spending endless hours at Long Beach and Good Harbor Beach, and watching the annual bonfire on Back Beach are among her favorite me- memories. When she, retur- when she retired in uh, 2017, her second home in Gloucester was where she wanted to be. Here, she has found the inspiration to follow her passion for writing and photography and the new world that opens up by combining the two. Uh, and also a, f- a friend and a, a, a someone I know from the Gloucester Writer Center. So I give you Kathleen Williams. Thank you, Bill. And thank you all for being here tonight. This is a wonderful event. A great shout out to the Gloucester 400 team for an amazing year of programs and events. Thank you all. So I have a question for you tonight. Is there anyone here who believes there is a sea serpent lurking around the waters of Cape Ann? I see a few hands. I see Maybe it's hanging out at the paint factory. Perhaps it went to Rockport for a few holiday shopping excursions. Maybe it slithered over to Essex for some clams. And for those of you who believe that there is a sea serpent, has any of you actually seen it? Awesome, I want to talk to you. (laughs) Did you know that the first recorded sighting of the sea serpent was way back in 1638 or 1639? I remember it clearly, I was a senior in high school. (laughs) As the story goes, there were some European people on a boat, along with some Native American people. And they were cruising around the harbor when all of a sudden they all saw the sea serpent, every one of them. Now the first reaction for the Europeans was to grab their guns and shoot at it. But the Native Americans said, whoa, 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 dude, you don't wanna do that. (laughs) Now you see the Native Americans knew about the sea serpent and they knew you didn't wanna make it mad or they were all gonna have a really bad day. Know what I mean? Well, the Native Americans prevailed and everybody was okay. Now, in thinking about how we refer to the Gloucester 400 plus, it's because we continue to honor and acknowledge that there were many, many people living here in Cape Ann for hundreds, if not thousands of years before settlers came from other countries. And I think the story is a great example of how the settlers learned from the knowledge and experience of the Native Americans. They knew this area and they certainly knew about the sea serpent. So I decided it would be fun to write a little story about what it might be like to actually see the sea serpent. Would you like to hear it? I was hoping you'd say that. (laughs) Sally Simpson said she saw said sea serpent sometime Saturday, supposedly. Cynical sister Susan Simpson suggested such sightings seem somewhat scuttlebutt. So, Shortly succeeding Sunday's sacred services, Susan Simpson, supporting Sister Sally Simpson, sauntered seaside, simply satisfying some serious suspicions. Systematically, Sally Simpson studied stony shorelines, scanned seascapes, searching signs, seeking sightings, squinting, scouring, stalking, said secretive sea serpent. Sadly, said sea serpent stayed submerged seriously scorning Sally's sensitive sight. Subsequently, suspecting something sinister skimming seaside surface, Sally Simpson swiveled swiftly. (laughs) Suddenly shocked, Sally Simpson seed sight. Sea serpent, she shrieked. Something splashed, slithered, silently sinking surreptitiously. So, Sally Simpson said she saw said sea serpent. Seriously? Some slippery salamander simply? She saw said sea serpent, she said so.
Wow, that was great. And uh, Alexander, I gotta say, your story took an unexpected turn. I was not expecting that story. And it, it actually fits the theme, because it's a starry night up in space, right? So um, our next speaker said she might be a little bit late. Is Mary Ellen here? Mary Ellen, she was right behind me. Okay, Mary Ellen, um, I hope I'm saying your last name right, Le Pianca? Okay, she, uh, you might know her already. She is, I hear a little bit of feedback. Yeah, there, there's, there's a, uh, uh, the, the mic needs to be closer to the user and the, the gain has to be turned down. I don't know how to make those adjustments, but <laughs> Al Alec, could you make that feedback go away? <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if you know what I didn't hear feedback before or earlier, so I don't know what's what's different. Test, test. Oh, that's fine. Does that sound better? Yes. Okay, I think we're good then. Test, test, test. One, two, three. Yeah. Test one, two, three. One, two, three. Great. So, <laughs> uh, Mary Ellen LaPianca, you may have heard of her name or you may have read her research about Native American peoples uh, here on Cape Ann. Uh, it's important research to know about. Uh, that is what she is probably most well known for around here and on all of her projects with the Cape Ann Museum and other organizations. But tonight she's here to tell a different type of story. So please welcome to the stage Mary Ellen LaPianca. <laughs> Thank you. Christmas 1973, Vancouver, Canada. I'm in dire straits. I've had a baby, left my husband, dropped out of my PhD program, and lost my teaching fellowship. I've rented rooms, a, a furnished room in a vacant Victorian house on the outskirts of town. My baby's 11 months old, and it's her first Christmas, and I'm damn well going to provide one. So I'm casting about looking for something that could serve as a Christmas tree. And out the window, there's not much going on, but, but the neighbor has a tree, beautiful tree, a big fir tree, and there are branches coming over the fence. And I'm thinking, that's it, that's the only chance. So furtively, over the next two days, I tried to get the branch off that tree, using everything in the house I could find that was sharp. I finally got it off with a serrated bread knife, <laughs> propped it up in a, a coffee can, and decorated it. Decorated it with salvaged balls of tinfoil, pork chop bones that had interesting shapes that I had saved, bleached and painted with nail polish to look like candy canes, a hair ribbon, red, and some popcorn strung with needle and thread. It made a decent tree. My child certainly enjoyed it. I sang every Christmas song I could remember, and then I played the only music I had available, which was a, on a portable record player. I had two albums, uh, Montovani on a Scratch 78, and Frank Sinatra, Only the Lonely. I didn't have anything else. We were very alone. I had no car, no television, no radio, no telephone. And so it was just this record player, this Christmas tree, and my baby and me. So uh, I sang all the Christmas songs I could remember, and then I put on the records, first the Montavani and then the Sinatra. Some of you probably know that album. <laughs> I can see people in the audience who would be old enough to know that album. So in the middle of the one where Sinatra is singing to his bartender, set him up, Joe, because he's got to have one for the baby and one more for the road. Right in the middle of that, the power goes off. Oh, so now, in addition to having nothing, we have no sound, no light, and it's suddenly very cold and I wrap us up in an armchair with all the blankets I can find in the house, and that's when I lose it, finally. And in the middle of losing it, I hear this knocking, uh, knocking on the door. So at first I ignored it, because I thought I must be you know, hallucinating or delusional or something. 
obviously there's nobody here that would know me that would be knocking on the door. But the knocking persisted for quite a long time, so finally I got up. It was snowing out and windy. I opened the door and the wind blew open the door and here's this apparition in the doorway. It's this very, very large, very tall woman. She's got a big mane of black hair framing her face. She's wearing a floral nylon jumpsuit and nothing else except for rubber boots. And uh, she's got a candle in one hand and an open bottle of whiskey in the other hand. <laughs> and she comes into the room, I'm sort of, you know, nonplussed. <laughs> and uh, she steps out of the rubber boots at the door and comes into the room barefoot. Hi, she says, I'm Mimsy from Dawson Creek. Okay, and I'm thinking I'm still hallucinating or something, you know. And uh, she says, uh, that's my house next door. So I, I sort of move over a little bit to block her view of her tree. <laughs> I was feeling pretty guilty about that already. So and she says, I run that house as a boarding house for the boys that come down from the Klondike to try to find work in the city. Oh, I'm thinking, that's why I see men coming in and out of that house day and night, you know? That's what, you, that's what they're doing. I had wondered about that. So um, then she comes in, she walks around me, she looks at the branch, a nice tree, she says. She doesn't realize it's her tree. And she doesn't say anything about the pork chop bones, <laughs> which I was going to have difficulty explaining. Uh, so um, she says she... She's come over to see your little one, she says, and to make sure you're okay. Uh, so we, we sit down, and she offers me the whiskey, but I'm a ner nursing mother, and I have to say no. Uh, but the candle is welcome, and I'm still not able to actually form a complete sentence. I don't think I actually made a complete sentence the whole time she was there. I was just sort of in shock over the whole, whole thing. So then she says... Um, I, I have something for your little one. Uh, I made it, she says, it's, it's a bean bag. And, uh, but it's not really a bean bag because it's made with dried peas. There's dried peas in it, not beans. She wanted to make sure that I knew that. She takes out this round thing. It's red, it has button eyes, a corduroy mouth and blue hair. Pretty ugly, I mean, it was really pretty homely. And she hands it to me. And, and I've got my babe in arms, and I'm, I'm holding this thing, and I'm looking at this apparition. And um, she senses that I'm in a state of shock. So she says in a very comforting tone, you know, your little one is too young now to, to play with it. But you just wait, she said. One of these days, she'll be old enough to toss it with you, and she'll have fun tossing it with you. And it was like like uh, my brain bursting open with the realization that she had given me the gift of the hope of a more positive future. <laughs> and this was the greatest gift of all. And meanwhile, I still have the bean bag. <laughs> and I'm happy to share it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary Ellen, for that cheer. We need it this season, and uh, we're grateful for it. Um, our last poet, and unless we get another chance for another poem, uh, is Deborah Leipziger. Uh, Deborah is an author, poet, and advisor on sustainability. Born in Brazil, Ms. Leipziger uh, is the author of Story and Bone, published by Lily Poetry review books. Her poems have been published in the UK, US, Canada, Mexico, Colombia, Israel, and the Netherlands in search magazine, in, I'm sorry, in such magazines and journals as Pangira, Salamander, Lily Poetry Review, and Revista Cardinal. Her chapbook, Flower Map, was published by Finishing Line Press in 2013. Deborah is a recipient of grants from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and she has had residences at the T.S. Eliot House and Wellspring House. She's also a friend of mine from the Bagel Bards group. Welcome, Deborah.
Thank you. It's such a joy to be here celebrating 400 years of Gloucester. I'm going to share a poem that I wrote at uh, T.S. Eliot House. And um, it's one of my favorite places in Gloucester is Brace Cove. And I, I, I would go there every day as I would write. And um, I, I learned while I was at T.S. Eliot House the term desire path. That is a path that is made by walking. And so I love that term. And this is the, the entrance to Brace Cove is the, a desire path. Brace Cove. My path meanders through sea roses. Waves glimmer in meeting me. To the right of the ocean is a pond filled with lily pads. A rocky path divides the bodies of water. I walk the beach, the sand pressing up against my feet, the scent of low tide and all it brings. Small white shells, each with a tiny hole, globes of seaweed on the sand engorged, like a multi-chambered heart, ventricles fill with seawater. And I wanted to uh, recognize uh, Dana uh, Hawks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to recognize Dana Hawks, who runs the T.S. Eliot House. And uh, it's such a wonderful experience for writers, really life changing. And I'm going to close with a poem, um, a love poem from my, my new book, Story and Bone, uh, just um, a poem that I wrote at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, in Boston, and uh, we were given a prompt um, to write about uh, someone we love as a forest. And so this is for my partner, Andy Hoffman. You as a forest, I listen to the shelter of you, the sweeping canopy cradling the day and night of me, the moon rising in your branches, the stars falling into the sweep of your hair. I see the feet of your forest, the fingers, the limbs, the concave and convex of you, the light that falls around us. I smell your maple, fern, ivy, the light serpentine falling through the rings of redwoods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Two beautiful poems. So um, we're going to have time to squeeze one more poem in by yours truly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> this is. Uh, a poetry <laughs> this is called uh, Cape Ann, a tribute. Um, Morning stillness broken by the siren song of gulls soaring above, not far off. Their plaintive cry beckons me to the sea, which I can see from my window. Beyond the shining silver steeple of St. Anne's Church and the Belle Epoque bell tower and clock of City Hall, where the walls are adorned with murals depicting the civic virtues. Surrounded by water, this island cape cut by blind men so long ago when they were done fudging and pulled their skiffs onto the mud after a long day fishing. This strange land of rocks and hills where no street is straight, where big trucks are parked in front of little houses, where colorful buoys adorn the shed, where boats swathed in shrink wrap sit motionless on trailers instead of floating in their proper aqueous element. This town of churches gives its parishioners something to pray for each and every day as they go down to the sea in ships in search of fish and thrills. Sometimes it is not only fish that are killed in a place full of storms and danger with rocks above and below the murky surface of the deep, they all know the risks and the promises they must keep. Ruddy-faced and tattoo-splattered, fishermen are in this place easy to spot all around town, sorry, all around town, um, 
at bars and restaurants where they go down to eat the food they catch at sea, prepared this way and that. Each restaurant has its speciality, Portuguese, Italian, and boiled Yankee fare can be found there. And then there are those who quarry the stones and the rocks. They hail from Finland, Sweden. They cut this hard land into square blocks. They hewed a living from pure granite, built stout piers jutting into the waves where I can stand on it and see the sea splashing all around me. Home of poets and artists, too, Cape Ann offers so much to do besides strenuous work on water or land. She also gave quarter to those who think and write, to those who paint the canvas bright with that enchanting magical light cast down from above. It's a good place to fall in love. And then there is the beautiful harbor, dubbed Le Beauport by Samuel de Champlain. You can see it from the hotel veranda where you can sit and sip champagne. And there's the greasy pole, phallic symbol of St. Peter's feast. He who nabs the pennant at the end of it is carried around town on a throne as if it were a triumph in ancient Rome. On this stone I will build my cape, said Mother Nature not so long ago, as giant glaciers receded and brought with them a thousand feet of ice and snow. For 12,000 years, native peoples lived here, founding First Nations with names like Wampanoag, Massachusetts, Penacook, Pawtucket, Abenaki, Micmac, Nipmuc. For 12,000 years, these names have endured and still endure today. John Smith mapped her craggy contours in 1614. He named three islands Turk's heads, which he removed in mortal combat and placed upon his scutcheon once they were dead. Smith was rescued by the girl from Trebizond, with whom he jolly well must have got it on. But the cape he mapped could not be called by such a foreign name. So appalled was King James. He named the place after his mother, Anne of Denmark, a tradition from which we have yet to depart. Old Rogers played his part in the American Revolution when our country got its start. He and his boys put the lights out on the island called Thatcher. And in 1812, the British invasion was repulsed on Sandy Bay when rough and ready fishermen snatched her little cannon away from the naughty frigate nymph. Ever since, it sits on the church green to this very day as if to say, tread on me and I'll make you pay. This august history sits side by side cute boutiques and candy shops where you can find rich chocolates and sugary sweet lollipops saltwater taffy and buttery fudge. After eating that, who can hold a grudge as old as 1812? I could carry on and sing of Anisquam, Lanesville, Niles Beach, and Rocky Neck. What the heck, there's so much more to write about. There's 10 pound island and five pound two. About Dogtown, there is much ado. And then there's Bearskin Neck, where Babson slayed the solitary earth sign with only a knife alone. This made Cape Ann very fine to inhabit so it can be turned into the place you and I call home, sweet home. Thank you. I guess I'll introduce myself. So <laughs> I am Terry Weber Mangos. I am the stories project leader for the Gloucester 400. Can you hear me in the back there? Okay. Um, oh, starry night. My dad wasn't an astronomer. He was a physicist. He was a scientist. He loved to explore the sky and he liked to figure out how things worked. Some people referred to him as the crazy scientist who lived on the hill. He even kind of looked the part. He had white shaggy hair, he had thick brown glasses, and if you walked into his house, you would see him surrounded by all of his tools and books and everything, it was, it was a mess. But that was the way he lived. He loved to explore things. One time, he asked me if I wanted to go up to the top of the house and watch a meteor pass. 
And at the top of our house was a cupola, and I don't know if you know what a cupola is, but many houses have them. It's that structure at the very top that doesn't seem to serve much of a function, but it, 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 is, it did serve as a lookout and still can. And sometimes it's at the top of a barn as well. He asked me if I wanted to go up there and see the meteor that night, and I said, of course. I was about eight years old, so I had not yet really bored of my dad's adventures yet. All my older brothers and sisters are like, eh, I've seen meteors before, but I went up with him. He, uh, to get ready for this, we had to prepare. And what you do is there is no, there is no light, no heat up in a cupola, and it's, it was winter. So at about sunset, he went up and set up his telescope. And he didn't just have regular telescopes. Remember, he was a, uh, an astronomer. He had all kinds of things and probably homemade lenses as well. And he set it up at sunset, so it was facing the north sky. And then we went downstairs and waited. And he said we had to wait until the perfect time. I don't know how he knew when the perfect time was going to be. I was only eight. I just thought of this all as being kind of magical. So we went back up. Uh, with our winter coats on and our flashlights and a map of the sky that he had. And uh, we stood there and he told me just to wait a minute, he was gonna adjust the telescope, which he did. It took him several minutes to do that and I watched him in the dark. There was a bit of light coming in the windows. On this cupola, you, there was room enough for two and it had a window facing in each direction. Uh, that night there was a crescent moon, a very, thin sliver, and so there was enough light to see up there on our own. And when you looked out the window, you could see the, the tops of the trees, uh, our backyard, etc. cetera. And but what I noticed most was my dad's silhouette in the window as he was adjusting his telescope, and it's a memory that stayed with me since then. And finally he yelled out, I got it, I got it, I need you to look, I need you to look now. And so I went over there and I looked and at first I couldn't see a thing because he had adjusted it for himself. And I said, I don't see anything. I just see blurs and dots. And so he allowed me to touch his precious telescope and adjust it so that I could see it myself. And I did see it. I saw what looked like a snowball to me, a pale yellow snowball going across the sky with what I called snowflakes behind them. And um, I looked at it. Remember, I'm eight years old. And I said, well, who's driving that? <laughs> And he, he laughed and he said, no one's driving, it's not who, it's what. And I said, well, what's making it move? And he said, that's kind of complicated, but it has to do with the sun and gravity. And after he said gravity, I kind of stopped listening, but, you know, I looked it up later. Um, but he did explain it to me. After we looked at the meteor for a while, he then showed me some other things in the sky. And we also used the map that he brought up in our flashlight and he was showing me, because we couldn't see everything through our, through our window there. Uh, but he did show me the Big Dipper, uh, the North Star, and he told me about navigating the sky. Um, if I were lost in the woods at some night for some reason, how I could navigate to a northerly direction by knowing these things. And this was all kind of mind-blowing to me. And um, it's, it's something that, again, stayed with me. That night I went to sleep and I was dreaming of the skies. I was dreaming about who and what might be moving that comet. Um, fast forward to 2008 at my dad's funeral. My dad was a very prominent uh, astronomer, and the eulogy was given by Dr. Brian Marsden from Smithsonian. And so he was there, he was given a speech. I had no idea what he was going to be talking about. I obviously knew he was going to talk about my dad, but I didn't know the specifics. And at the end, he closed it by saying, Dr. Weber is not dead. Dr. Weber is out there on the front seat of a comet. He's out there, he's exploring the universe, he has his notebook and he's taking notes and he's looking around and he's saying, that's how that works. His eulogy gave me great comfort because to me, my father had just died, I, you know, it was the end. The way Dr. Marsden explained it though was really just the beginning of another journey for my dad. So that, that did make me feel a bit better. And I thought to myself, hmm, well, anything is possible, I, I suppose, and maybe someday I could be on that comet with my dad exploring the very starry, starry night. Yes, sir. <laughs> 
is kind of awkward because now I have to transition to saying there's food in the back. <laughs> so there is food in the back. I really want everyone to go enjoy it. There's plenty of food back there. I want to thank all of our writers and poets and everybody who attended tonight. It's really just a great feeling to see everyone in this room to share these stories with you. Thank you, Bill Falsitona, for co-coordinating as well. Um, thank you, everyone.